The Montana Heritage Tour is a six-part series featuring mostly small rural museums. This project is a joint venture between the Montana Historical Society and Helena Civic Television. You can find cultural and historical treasures no matter which way you travel across the Big Sky State. The nice thing about starting in Helena is that when you drive out of town in any direction, you're going to find gold. In this final installment in the Montana Heritage Tour series, we head north and west across the Continental Divide to visit museums in Whitefish, Libby, and Polson. Our first point of disembarkation was at the Stumptown Historical Society in Whitefish, a railroad town named for a species that predates trout in Whitefish Lake. Jill Evans introduced us to wonderful memorabilia illustrating the community's storied past. We started with the building itself and its connection to the railroad. Brief history of the building, it's a Tudor style that was built in 1927 by Lewis Hill. He's the same man who built the chalets in Glacier Park. And he's the son of James Hill who started the Great Northern Railway. In 1970, the Great Northern was bought out by the Burlington Northern, or a merger, whatever that proper term is. And then 20 years after that, in 1990, Burlington Northern decided to tear the building down. And long story short, the, the Historical Society and the town said no. We bought it for a dollar, which means the railroad wrote it off their books, basically. And then we spent $850,000 um, renovating and restoring it. We now own it free and clear. We paid that bill off about five years ago. And so we, in the restoration process, we took a corner of it to create the Whitefish Museum. And that's the story. And now we rent to both Burlington Northern Santa Fe and Amtrak. And we have two Amtrak passenger trains a day, one at 7 in the morning and one at 9 at night, east and west, respectively. And startlingly, we have a tiny little lobby there, but we put 65,000 passengers through that uh, little lobby last year. So it's a hugely busy passenger um, service. The, uh, this is an interesting point, the Amtrak train that runs through is named the Empire Builder, and that was James Hill's nickname. So just a little bit of history there for you. But it's also a very busy um, freight center. We right now are uh, seeing anywhere from 40 to 50 trains, freight trains a day. Coal, things from China, the, the railroad that runs between Seattle and New York, you know, Chicago, New York, is actually like a bridge between the oceans. So we see a lot of traffic in this little town. It's still a railroad town. And the Historical Society owns the train station, which is a wonderful small town story. I am the only paid staff, and the rest of everything that's done is done by volunteers. And, and the biggest thing that we do that the public is aware of is run this wonderful little small town museum and that's all with volunteers and as you look around I hope that you get some uh, snapshots of, of some of our archival work here it's all donated we have no acquisition budget so it's a it's a love of a small town and the, and the people who who help us save the history we had to ask Jill why was Whitefish called Stumptown well, the, the wording is um, based on the fact that when small western towns uh, became railroad towns, the trees had to be cut down to plat them. And so uh, the only two towns I'm positive of that had the nickname of Stumptown is Whitefish and Portland. There are probably others, but the name kind of stuck when in 1970 our librarian wrote the book that she titled Stumptown to Ski Town. So that's kind of there, it's fun. Jill told us about Dorothy Johnson, a famous Western author who moved to Whitefish when she was five. Uh, she loved Whitefish, she grew up here. Her autobiography is entitled, When You and I Were Young, Whitefish. It's a wonderful story. 
She is well known for her Western writing. She wrote um, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, A Man Called Horse. They're very familiar Western stories. She was an editor in New York and later moved back home to Montana to Missoula where she worked um, at the university as a teacher in the journalism department. But it was always, Whitefish was always her town. We actually for some years had uh, Dorothy Johnson days where she would come back and we'd all have a party. Dorothy passed away in 1987, so the annual parties are no more. But Dorothy's legacy lives on. There's so much to see in this small museum space. Looking at the sundries from the past in a glass case brings to mind the many types and brands of pharmaceutical products on the market today. Another display area highlights the enduring importance of outdoor recreation in this part of the state. One of the things that people know about a lot is that we have a actually a very, very world-class high quality ski area. It used to be known as Big Mountain and recently changed the The mountain is still Big Mountain, but the resort is called the uh, Whitefish Mountain Resort. If you're a skier, come to Whitefish. Another fun thing in our museum is the story of our golf course, which started out as a WPA work project that was supposed to be an airport and it magically turned into a golf course. So that's a fun Whitefish story. And then, of course, we're wild about our, our um, bulldogs, our sports teams, and our schools. And it's a charming museum. It's, it's enchanting. If you're in Whitefish, you need to come. We could not leave the Stumptown Historical Society without inquiring into the origins and evolution of the fur-bearing trout. Jill mercifully gives us the Cliff Notes version of the story. One long, boring winter in Whitefish, which happens, uh, a local taxidermist created a fur-covered a, a fur fish, whatever the proper term is. Um, shortly after that, the public relations manager for the Great Northern, and this was way back in the 20th century, maybe in the teens, uh, saw this and went nuts about it and, and used it, created a postcard and used it to to put passengers on the Great Northern, to bring them out, come to Whitefish. So that story continued and the Historical Society got possession of the fish. As I, as I said, we have no acquisition budget, so it was given to us at some point. And a couple years ago, I ran, we had postcards made as well. I ran out of those and contacted a dear friend of mine who's a gifted photographer, just to have her take another picture of the Hickens famous world. Well, that wasn't good enough for her, so she took her a photo of her husband ice fishing, created another fur-bearing fish with Robert Fur, and our local newspaper, which loves our whimsy, uh, came and did a big story on it. We have a ring binder of lots of stories about the fur-bearing fish and and those who who love and cherish the the whimsy of whitefish with our with our fish. It's a pretty straight shot from Whitefish to Libby on U.S. Highway 2, and it's a pretty drive, too, along the Kootenai River. The 110 miles go fast when you're on the Heritage Tour. At the Libby Heritage Museum, we were greeted by Mark Moraine, who quickly demonstrated an enthusiastic pride of place that pretty much goes with the territory in the realm of small Montana museums. As you're driving down the highway, you, you might, a person might look over and they, they see this uh, really interesting big log building and, and there's lots of signage out there to direct you to what is here so you, you could recognize that it's a museum right away. There might be a lot of cars there. They would maybe just pull in here and, and once, once people get here for the first time and, and come inside, they think they're, they're very pleasantly surprised by what is here because uh, you don't really notice it or would know from the outside, but we have an extensive collection inside. It's, uh, it's well presented. It's uh, very varied in its content, a, a lot of history here. It's just a really excellent museum. And the building itself is quite unique because it is a 12-sided log structure. It's 130 feet 
in, in diameter across. Um, it's quite large, it's three stories high. And I want to say that the museum itself is 100% volunteer. We have no paid employees. Everybody that's involved with it, from the, from the board members to the people that work outside on the grounds, are all volunteers. This facility was originally devoted to the work of a local artist named Roy Porter. As he and others collected all sorts of stuff, the museum incorporated items from the fur trade area, mining, and the logging industry. Most folks in Montana are well aware of the historically significant explorations of Lewis and Clark, but in Libby you can learn the exploits of another intrepid voyager here in the northwest corner of the state. I'm standing in front of an, an exhibit that um, we constructed in, in 2008 as a tribute to David Thompson and the bicentennial of David Thompson's uh, arrival in uh, this part of the country. Now, David Thompson was a European explorer that in uh, 1808 was employed by the Northwest Company and he, he first crossed the Continental Divide and came into this country in, in 1808 and, and came down the Kootenai River and established a trading post just outside of Libby um, which they called Fort Kootenai or, or Kootenai Post. And so at the age of 13 he came to North America and never, uh, never left, never went back. He grew up as a fur trader and a clerk in North America and he, he uh, had a, an education in the classics. He was uh, uh, very good at math. His interest was mapping and exploring geography, cartography, and so um, even though he was employed as a trader, he uh, spent his, all of his, his downtime, if you will, um, learning how to make maps and, and doing it, going out and exploring and learning how to use a sextant and, and, and uh, establishing where he was. He covered more ground than anyone um, uh, mapping, mapping North America, primarily the upper reaches of the United States and, and Canada. Of course, he was a British subject and he, that's what, uh, what he, he did. And one of the neat things about David Thompson is that we know a lot about him because he left a huge amount of journals. I, I believe there were like 33 journals that he left notes in. Now, a lot of that stuff is, is numbers and, and locations and courses and stuff because he recorded all of that kind of stuff. And he was very prolific that way. Um, but he was very accurate. Even today with our modern GPS systems and our, the accuracy we have, David Thompson was ex extremely accurate almost everywhere he went. Very seldom was he off uh, a, a great deal. Uh, most of the time it was very close, within feet. From the monumental map-making endeavors of David Thompson, we migrated to a button collection, diminutive in scale but almost startling in beauty. This display was one of several recently revamped by volunteers. There was a local collector named William Stolarczyk who donated his button collection to, hit to the museum and there was upwards of 3,000 buttons in that collection. And they were all in this little tiny display case and you couldn't really see any of them. So we went in and uh, redid that button display and, and made uh, what we think is a very nice visual display of, of buttons and the historical significance and a timeline to go along with it. And, just to make it a little more interesting, I mean, how, how interesting can buttons be? Well, buttons can be very interesting if, if you have them presented right. And so we did that. And the other display that we uh, redid at the same time is, is a toy display, which also was in desperate need of, of revamping. And so we just kind of uh, threw around some ideas and put together a, a, a basic toy display, a very small display, but, but it looks very good, I think. We have um, full life-size mounts uh, of uh, an elk calf, a moose calf, uh, a white-tailed fawn, um, and, and just about almost, not entirely, but almost every example of, of both mammal and bird that lives in, in this habitat, in this country, you know. Um, quite extensive uh, and numbers numbers wise we probably have upwards of 200 mounts in the museum
Small museums in Montana are a wonderful place to encounter small novelties and relics of the past three centuries that are very large indeed. The Libby Heritage Museum delivers both. There's a wagon, uh, uh, I guess you'd call it a bucket wagon. Um, and it's back in the days when they fought fire by hand and they had bucket brigades of guys that were hold, would move uh, water bucket by bucket, hand to hand, to put out a fire. And they, they had this wagon that was pulled by a horse or pushed by uh, human power or pulled by human power to the side of the wagon. And it, it's just a row of buckets that could be filled. And there's also a ladder on that, on that, uh, that you could be used to access a building that was on fire or whatnot. Uh, it's just a, a piece of equipment that you don't see very often and you probably don't hear about. You know, they, they were, they're delegated to the dust heap of history and, and, but it's in, it's in really good shape. We asked Mark to tell us about a big piece of railroad equipment outside the building, a steam locomotive used to haul logs to the sawmills in years past. Originally, it was a locomotive that was brought to Libby, Montana by the, uh, the J. Neal Lumber Company to haul logs from the surrounding areas into the lumber mill here at, at Libby. And it's known as the Shea. Shea was a manufacturer of the, of the uh, locomotive and it's, it's known locally as Shea Number 4. It was used in this uh, community, like I said, to haul logs on, on extensive railroads both north and south of Libby. Uh, that's how they hauled the logs into the, into the mill. And it, it was used that, that way for many years and then it was uh, retired and replaced by a, a little larger locomotive but, and then it spent many years after that in the yard just moving railroad cars, switching cars back and forth and, and used in the yard for many years. But it was, it was on the grounds of the museum for, for many years and it's really in remarkable shape. There are very few examples of Shea locomotives in existence anymore and it is right now that's one of the big projects that the museum has undertaken. Uh, some volunteers are interest, very interested in railroad and, and they've taken on the project of restoring that Shea to operable condition. When you're in this neck of the woods, it's just a 50 mile scenic drive west and south from Libby to take in the Ross Creek Cedars in the Kootenay National Forest. This rare stand of ancient trees is sort of an outdoor museum crafted by nature. Places like this are conducive to thoughts about the past, present, and future. It's not often that a rural museum bears the imprint of a single person and his ideology, but the miracle of America Museum in Polson is a grand material testament to one man's pride of country. We're 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, I don't receive any funds from the museum and we have a board of directors. Uh, we've got an endowment started, but uh, we're going to have to get that enlarged uh, quite a bit. So when I pass, uh, uh, you know, my, I have a grandson that's uh, mentally prepared for it, for takeover, but uh, right now he's raising his own family and it wouldn't, uh, so I've got to last a little while longer. Well, the miracle of America, uh, basically refers to the Constitutional Convention at Philadelphia, which was referred to as a miracle at Philadelphia because so many men, 56 uh, men, got together on something that was so complex and yet so simple uh, as the Constitution of the United States. A lot of our displays talk about the freedoms and, and uh, the Industrial Revolution, which came about as a result of the freedom that the Constitution guaranteed free enterprise, if you will. And one of our displays is the mousetrap display, build a better mousetrap and the world will be to pass your door. Well, that, that was a free enterprise message that, uh, that my grandparents and, and parents uh, would have heard. I grew up probably like most American kids, uh, taking our freedom for granted. And then I uh, joined the Army. I was uh, three years as a military policeman, a year at West Point. And it gave me some historical background and uh, the rest of my time over in Frankfurt, Germany. From there I took a three-day pass uh, and went up into Berlin, western sector, and then I went through as a tourist 
into, into the eastern sector of Berlin through Checkpoint Charlie. And the depression uh, was just overwhelming there, to be behind the Iron Curtain, to be in an enslaved uh, uh, country. There was no children laughing, there was no rebuilding of the buildings like there was in the western sector. And, and so very depressing. And uh, when I came back, I got out of the army. About that time, the Vietnam War was just starting up in the anti-American protest. And, and uh, as our displays in our military section uh, attest to, war is a very terrible thing, but, but freedom is so important. And one thing worse than war is, is slavery. And so at times, we've had to go to war. And, and some of our displays show uh, that this a little bit touch on the fact that some of those were politically caused, that's unfortunate. But our, our soldiers, are, that's a generic term, meaning all branches of service, both genders, uh, have laid their life on the line so we could be free. And so a uh, freedom message here uh, and uh, being guaranteed by the Constitution and coming about as a result of that miracle at Philadelphia, I think that's where the, the root word comes from. Well, we're at a soda fountain that re recreated. We actually built the counter here and, and, uh, and upholstered the stools, but the fountain itself is a 1925 uh, fountain, and it was originally used down in Ronan at, uh, at uh, a drugstore down there. And I remember when, my, uh, when I was about six years old, my grandmother bought me a chocolate malt from that, from that fountain there. I don't know if a lot of people know, but uh, the person working behind the, the soda fountain was called a soda jerk. And that was because they had to jerk on the, uh, on the two black handles up there to get the soda water out. And a soda jerk was a very important person in town. Eclectic is too subtle a word for this giant collection of just about everything you can think of that's sort of old and sort of wild. Well, an elderly friend of ours uh, worked for the uh, studios that filmed uh, Wizard of Oz. And he moved up, uh, he retired and moved up to the Flathead Lake here and we became good friends. Then he had uh, done this uh, winged monkey for us as a study for the studios. And uh, for those that may not know what a study is, it, it, it's an, an actual thing that, uh, that the artist or in this case a committee can look at and, and study and discuss decide if that's what they want to indeed use in their painting, carving, or, or the movie. And so, so he, uh, he willed that uh, to us, and uh, when he passed, uh, we got that. Anyhow, that's, it's exciting, and most of the kids uh, recognize it. Although some of the younger ones, they haven't seen Wizard of Oz. You know, it's, it's funny that uh, some of the older movies like, that, that we're familiar with, uh, uh, they haven't seen yet. Outside the main building, we asked Gil about the child-friendly Area 51. And out there you'll see, uh, uh, actually I have three. One is perched on the roof. They're made out of TV dishes. And then the, then the cupola on them were uh, actually covers for restaurant uh, exhaust fans. And so I found uh, three of those uh, in a salvage yard down in Missoula one time. That was all there were and I bought all three. And eventually I found enough discs to make the, the three UFOs. And the one I made uh, mounted on a, a lawnmower chassis, so it, it will actually run down the road. We've had it in parades in nine different towns. We've got lights on it and a siren and, and, a, and a flashing light on top. And it's a real kick. Uh, the other one I made, uh, raise it up the ground a little bit and cut an opening in the bottom so the kids could get up in that. I've got some instruments and switches they love. They love flipping switches and that. And they can put their face up to the porthole and uh, portholes and, and, and uh, have their picture taken. So. And then there's an alien out there I built from, uh, from uh, some street light parts uh, and uh, some radio speakers and some other things. I, I try and build a lot of sculpture use, reutilizing uh, surplus stuff or junk or just, you might call it trash. And uh, I call that alien AT. That's a cousin to ET. And AT stands for another terrestrial. And the kids can stand up next to that and put, the, put his arm with the, with the magic finger there, with the, the, like, like ET healed the, healed the heart, and, you know. 
Multiple modes of transportation are on display outside and inside the Miracle of America Museum. We're a year-round museum. We can't shovel paths out there but, uh, to every building, but the winter display, the winter uh, tools and toys, we have uh, three original uh, winter items from Glacier National Park that they phased out. One's a 1941 rotary snow plow, a 52 uh, Tucker snow cat, and a prior snow crawler that they had built in the East Glacier Maintenance Shop. So those all run. Gil Mangles has a story for just about everything in this place, and that's a lot of stories. And some of them do indeed contain the stuff of minor miracles. The intergenerational bonding that takes place, we see many uh, three and four generation families coming through, and that is really heartwarming to see them sharing. And, and uh, the antiques will prompt uh, the older people, prompt their memory, and, and, and they'll start sharing. We've had some, some reunions have happened here at the museum, they're just miraculous. Some people that graduated 50 years later, they hadn't seen one another. 50 years later, they just happened to be in the museum here and get to visiting. And I had the similar thing happen with our military police chief I restored, like the one I had in Germany. And uh, uh, I hadn't seen these two fellows since 1963, November. They came through the museum about four or five years ago, saw my Jeep with the markings on it, didn't know who, who uh, had started the museum or anything. My name wasn't even in their mind. And they said, they asked the receptionist, so what's the deal with this Jeep? That was my wife at the time, at, uh, was being the receptionist at the time. And uh, she said, well, my husband was stationed over in Germany and that was his unit. Well, where is he? <laughs> and one guy came running over to my machine welding shop that I make a living at and uh, he recognized me from a distance. Well, it's just about a miracle, I mean, you know, to, to have something like that happen. And I've had a lot of things like that happen. What I'd like to see is more people uh, realize that the diversity of the museum. We have art as well. We have something for just about every interest. And uh, sometimes we see ladies sitting out in the car and knitting or reading a book and their husband's going through the museum. And sometimes the husband will, will go through a little ways and then he'll run out and get her and drag her in. Uh, and, and then she still wants to look when he when he's, figures he's done. We've had teenagers that uh, didn't want to really come in the museum, but the parents had drug them in. Those teenagers loved it. In fact, uh, one of them uh, said we were the awesomest. So we put that on our rear board for a while. As always, the road trip between museum towns brings opportunity to encounter people in leisurely pursuit of recreation in Montana's splendid natural settings. They are the farmers, the miners, the timber workers and millwrights, the small business owners and the captains of industry. They are the hands and the minds, the shoulders and the backs that made Montana. And we're proud to say that we see them in more than just museums. We see them in the people we continue to serve today. Montana State Fund, proud supporter of Montana's museums and the Montana Historical Society.